This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. Even the best talk-based practices in parenting can be limiting. How can art help parents temper storms of emotion, diffuse sibling conflicts, get teeth brushed, and raise happy, successful kids? In The Innovative Parent, Erica Curtis and Ping Ho integrate cutting-edge research, years of clinical expertise, and their own parenting experience into a revolutionary yet practical guide to creative parenting. Plentiful illustrations and anecdotes bring concepts to life and show art in action with kids and parents. Together, Curtis and Ho let parents in on art therapy trade secrets to help children make sense of emotions, build connections with others, develop problem-solving skills, resolve day-to-day conflicts, process and retain information, confront fears and anxiety, and much more. These are complex tasks for something as seemingly simple as making art. Yet therein lies the beauty of the innovative parent. Its down-to-earth approach is simple, doable, and fun. Valerie Atelis interviews Erica Curtis, the author of The Innovative Parent, Raising Connected, Happy, Successful Kids Through Art. Erica Curtis, LMFT, ATRBC, is a marriage and family therapist and board-certified art therapist. Erica is an instructor and curriculum developer for UCLA Arts and Healing. She consults for the Board of Behavioral Sciences, the Foundation for Art and Healing, Loyola Marymount University, and more. Erica is a past board member of the American Art Therapy Association and past president of their Southern California chapter. Erica is an internationally sought speaker and has been cited in over 100 media outlets as an expert on creative approaches to psychological, relational, and emotional health. Erica maintains a psychotherapy practice in San Juan Capistrano, California. Meet Erica at therapywitherica.com. Here is the interview with Erica Curtis. In your own words, who is Erica Curtis? Uh, Well, so I am defined, I think, by many things, but of course include and transcend each of these parts of who I am. So I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. I am a board certified art therapist. I am a mother of three and I'm a writer and a speaker. And these are the activities and purposes that engage most of my time during my weeks. And so I think that I will leave it there for now. My first, the second official question, the warm up question is about happiness. What is happiness to you? Is that a destination that we should in a way strive to get to or an ongoing practice? I think that's a wonderful question, especially because I think one of the misdirections our society has taken is an emphasis on happiness and striving for happiness. And I find, especially in my psychotherapy practice, how many people are very unhappy simply because they are operating from a mindset of striving for this notion of happiness. Um, And even with younger generations now, the emphasis on um, meaning and purpose, which we can talk a little bit more about, I find is 
putting very young people in a bit of an existential crisis uh, early on before they're really ready to be grappling with some of that. So to answer your question, I think that um, happiness is really something that comes from meaning and purpose, making meaning of our lives, past, present, and future, and having a sense of, a core sense of self um, and who are we are as individuals. That makes a lot of sense to me. Thank you for your message on happiness and this pursuit and, and this striving, this trying too hard to be happy. And when it comes to purpose and meaning, would you say that what you do now is the purpose of your life at this time? Absolutely. I, I am very fortunate to be doing exactly what I love, uh, what I feel like I am meant to do. I have a story of following my heart and not really knowing what I wanted to do or be, so to speak, but just continue to do what sounded wonderful and um, aligned with my values. Um, and it was, it's funny because I actually, if somebody had asked me when I was a teenager or even when I was in college, if I wanted to become a therapist, I would have said, no, absolutely not. <laughs> but I couldn't think of anything more interesting and wonderful than to learn about people and the way that we behave and our psychology and, um, and really how to help people and, and essentially make the world a better place bring some more goodness into the world with my life, um, and then to align that with creativity and art and to learn more about how the, the act of creativity specifically can help people. And the next thing I knew, I was sitting across from clients and becoming a therapist. And once I was there, I, I knew it was what I meant to be doing. I, I felt like I had found my home. What does it take us to find purpose and meaning? Is that something that's related to time or experiences? What would that be? Like from your perspective, how did that happen? Sure. I think it's a combination. I think that what people believe should be their purpose or their meaning um, sometimes is not. Um, and sometimes that is not derived from work or the workplace, so to speak, but it's derived from other activities, relationships, pursuits in life. Um, I think that, and I, I observe that uh, we also come into the world with certain tendencies and personalities and gifts and inclinations. Uh, and a lot of things conspire in our childhood and our adolescence um, to varying degrees that can make it difficult to really appreciate those gifts that we have. And so sometimes it can take a process of also moving through the mud, so to speak, and coming back home and experimenting as well. I think going back to what I said earlier about seeing a lot of young adults coming into therapy with a lot of anxiety and even depression and worrying that they have not found their purpose yet, and they're working at a grocery store right now, and it's not purposeful, that the goodness in that um, is that, um, you know, their, their interest in pursuing something that is meaningful. On the other hand, they feel like they should have already figured it out. And so we'll talk a lot also about discovering ourselves also is discovering what doesn't align with us. Um, discovering what does align has to do with risk taking, safe risk taking and experimentation and saying this really aligns, this doesn't, this doesn't feel like it fits. Um, but it's not something that boom, we graduate or we have kids or we get married or some event happens in life and suddenly we know our purpose. I love that. That's a beautiful message too, Erica, about experimenting, about just, um, experiencing life and being open. I love the idea of curiosity, right? That we can be open to what's happening so we can see how what's happening makes us feel because it goes back to feeling, doesn't it? The way you speak about purpose and happiness, it's the way that we feel. That's when we know we found the purpose because it feels good, <laughs> light. <laughs> yes, yes. And again, it goes back to it aligns with 
who we are authentically aligns with our values. And, and yes, it is a felt sense because what brings me purpose um, will not bring somebody else purpose um, or meaning in their lives. And I absolutely agree with your statement about curiosity. I believe that when we are curious, then we can align more with our um, authentic selves. Um, and also when we engage curiosity, we can come back into alignment with our authentic selves. And so the very state of being that we experience when we're feeling connected with ourselves, with our environment, with others, um, we can access that and use certain tools to get ourselves back there by evoking a sense of curiosity. How do you define success these days, Erica? What is to be successful to you and some of the misconceptions we have about success? Sure. You know, success is an interesting question. And I think one that everybody grapples with to varying degrees. And I think the question that people often fail their, to fail to ask themselves or, or, or neglect to ask themselves is what is success to me as an individual? And that, again, the messaging that we get from our society, our communities, our families, our families of origin, um, that maybe those definitions of success become almost like the air we breathe, but again, it doesn't align with who we are. And so when we can step back and say, well, wait a minute, what is success? Um, because nobody in life is giving you a performance review, <laughs> right? And, and so much of our, especially early on in life, our upbringing through school successes defined by grades, by teacher comments, later on by um, employers, performance reviews. Um, but when we look at life and say, well, what is success really? Um, there is no performance review except for our own assessment of, um, do I have goals? Am I moving towards those goals? Um, and that sometimes those goals are not extrinsic. They're not material goals, that they can be intrinsic goals. Um, and saying, boy, you know, I was able to be more present for my kids. That's a success. Um, and so that we can look in terms of how do I want to not just define success, but I think what's difficult is people don't acknowledge that we need to redefine success for ourselves. Ah, I love that too. <laughs> I love I love your wisdom. Thank oh, you thank uh, for sharing that. Yes, absolutely. Redefining success, even happiness, all that coming from within who you are. It resonates as a spiritual message. So more spiritual insight, knowledge. So do you have any spiritual beliefs, Erica? Yeah, in terms of my, my psychotherapy practice, and it's very interesting being a therapist, as you may be aware, we tend to keep our own sort of personal beliefs to ourselves because that allows for um, a wide range of people to come into our lives and be able to explore their own spirituality in the way that they need to without fear of judgment or that I have certain inclinations or belief systems that might be different than theirs. And so it really opens up this we space where people can come in um, and explore um, I would say most consistently, though, in terms of a mindset that I take professionally when it comes to spirituality is the sense of uh, we've been talking about meaning and purpose, um, but just making sense, making sense of who we are, making sense of life and birth and death. Um, and these are questions that everybody grapples with. Um, and to, to varying degrees. Um, and so I believe that people in general in terms of a broad sense of purpose or meaning uh, is that we are tasked with moving more and more towards goodness in our lives. And that is what I hope to provide through my work um, is allowing people a space where they can move towards greater sense of goodness or beauty um, or what is more true to them. And so that that is sort of the overarching, I say, uh, would be my mindset, no matter who I'm sitting across and what their specific belief system is. That is really wonderful to hear. That's beautiful, wonderful. How many words can I use? <laughs> Big words for that. Giving the space. I love the way you say that. So others can heal. That's 
basically what you're doing. So it's a healing work. You're providing healing space or being, becoming even this space, the healing space for others. There's nothing more spiritual than that. I don't think, I don't think so. (laughs) Well, and really the space that's created between two people and what happens in that space. You know, it's funny, I have a plant in my office and I do not, I don't have a green thumb. I don't, (laughs) my plants at home, you know, that like if they, I've done a lot of succulents because they seem to tolerate me. But in my office, I have this plant and it just grows and grows and grows. And people will comment on it. And I just say, you know what? I just think it's because of all the beautiful work that is done in here and all the people come in here who want to better their lives and better their relationships. I was like, how can this plant not grow in here? <laughs> yes, anything would grow here. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that makes a lot of sense, of course. Yeah, that's a space for growth, right? Uh, I love that it resonates with the plants, right? Because um, <laughs> in the way you paid attention to that, you noticed that. Let me ask you one more warm-up question. Do you believe in um, universal purpose for the human experience? And if you do, what would that be? What is the goal? What is the purpose of being here in a human body? Well, I think that ties into what we were just speaking about, which is the gravitational pull towards um, more goodness and more truth, that that really is um, our collective purpose. And that everybody on this planet is, is at a different stage of development. Um, And I don't just mean children, adolescents, adults, but, you know, you take a number of children, a number of adolescents, a number of adults, um, and that each adult is at a different stage of their own evolution, their own conscious evolution, their own um, self or spiritual evolution. And so that we get, again, curious about that and uh, help each individual maximize their unique potential. Um, and depending on where they want to get to also, that uh, sometimes that there's, uh, okay, that's enough and that's fine. You know, I think that as human beings too, sometimes we want to push more and grow more than really our system's ready for. Um, so sometimes we push a little bit and then let it settle. And then we grow a little bit more and then we let it settle so that the whole system can get used to that change. And that makes me think about the idea of balance. Is that somehow connected to this experience in a body of being here to find or to realize that it's okay to lose balance and then go back to it, to dance that dance, that movement? Yes, yes, that that is part of the human experience. And going back to the question about happiness, I think one of the difficulties with striving for happiness is that... Uh, we come to expect that somehow we're not going to lose balance if we're happy, that we're not going to feel sad or mad or anxious, um, but that we'll just achieve happiness. And that is exactly sort of the opposite of what the human experience is. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And when we're in resistance of whatever it is that we're experiencing, we actually end up more distressed. That's another important message. So in a way, there's no destinations, right, Erica, for anything, but just the journey, the experience, the experimenting of this. Yeah. Yeah. I would say micro destinations, like pit stops. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Goals. Right. Right. True. Oh, pit stops. I like that. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Like little pit stops along the way, um, (laughs) but it is a never ending. And (laughs) that unfolds. And so perhaps I think my destination or my mini goal is this way, but I'm at a fork in the road and I didn't expect to go left, but now here I am going left, not right. Um, and how we can move with that and to use your, your term earlier, which I loved, which is dance with that and, and say, okay, well, here I am now I'm going left. Um, so I'm going to reevaluate my next pit stop. (laughs) (laughs) I love that too. Yeah. It's, uh, it's almost like a, a rest area. I remember traveling, I think, from New York to Florida. And I, I used to get really happy when I saw the rest areas. Yes. <laughs> like, oh, my God, I love them <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like a destination, but in the sense of a pause, reset, and just, yes. right? Yes, let's fuel up. Let's <laughs> yeah. check up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, the fun. Yes. 
Yeah, and let's have some fun. Actually, I love the idea of having fun throughout this whole experience. And it, that's what your work kind of caught my attention a lot, this idea of playfulness using art. So you wrote the book, The Innovative Parent, Raising Connected, Happy, Successful Kids Through Art. Talk to me about the main inspiration and intention of writing your book, Erica. So I was practicing in my work world, um, psychotherapy and with an emphasis on art therapy. And so integrating creativity um, with not just children and adolescents, but also with the adults with whom I've worked and finding so much value in terms of helping people to regulate their emotions, access parts of themselves or internal experiences that they didn't have words for, um, being able to take a step back and then physically observe, actually observe a representation of that internal world and then being able to make new meaning about it. And then in my home life as a mother of three, I found myself talking and talking and talking and talking and talking to my kids. <laughs> yes, I can imagine. Going, hmm, why isn't this working? <laughs> right. <laughs> And I knew all the best practices in talking to kids, right? I, I knew how to empathize and, you know, invite their anger. It's okay if you're mad with mommy and, you know, it's okay. And, you know, and, and you know, I hate you. Go away. I don't want to talk to you. Yeah, wow. <laughs> and I just kept thinking. And so one day I had a brainstorm and I thought, why am I not using what I see every day working in terms of accessing creative strategies to reconnect with my children when they're upset, help them learn about their emotional world, um, and ultimately be able to regulate, reconnect, and then problem solve. So I ran and I got a piece of paper one day. My son was in his bedroom with the door closed and he was angry and I stopped talking finally <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I went and I drew a picture. I just drew, actually what I drew were two circles and I drew a little like sad face and I wrote a little word problem, like an emoji. And I said, I'm sorry because I had gotten, you know, I had raised my voice at him. And, um, and so I wrote, I'm sorry. And then I drew another circle with an empty word bubble and I slipped it under the door with a pencil and within moments he drew a sad face and wrote I'm sorry in his word bubble and he slipped it back underneath the door to me yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I opened you know he opened the door and then we hugged and then we were able to talk about what happened so that was the start of okay that was sort of my brainchild of uh, there's something here that I'm not doing and parents don't have access to this information. There's lots of books out there about how to talk to your kids, how to listen to your kids, um, but very, very few, if any, really books um, about playing. Um, and, and as far as I could see, at least at the time um, of the writing of this book, nothing on the, the integration of creativity and art specifically for social, emotional, and cognitive growth in our own children, right? And how to do that at home. What a wonderful idea, approach, uh, initiative. Thank you so much, Erica, for doing that. It's really beautiful, your work. Uh, I went through the book and there are so many tips and so many techniques, ways I mean, this is not just for kids. This is for everyone. <laughs> we all need to learn. <laughs> I mean, I love to talk too, obviously, with the podcast. Yeah, you often use words for everything, but it's so much more powerful if we can show. Even not just showing with art or, or drawing, as you did, as you suggest too, but you talk about even replacing the way we communicate the phrases. For example, you have, I don't have the page here, but you say, Instead of saying, can I talk to you? Can I show you something <laughs> instead that opens up? Right. Yeah. And it would, might even be interesting for your listeners right now if they just, you know, maybe want to pause this or afterwards, if they just play around with those words in their own mind and see what happens, that if they imagine saying somebody, to, you know, if they imagine somebody saying to them, can I talk to them versus come here, I'd like to show you something and most people find a striking, you know, very clear difference inside their bodies where the first promotes a sense of anxiety and stress. Oh, no, I'm in trouble. Somebody wants to talk to me. Um, 
Whereas the second people, oh, you want to engage is curiosity, right? I'd like to show you something. I want to do something with you. It invites reconnection. Um, it invites curiosity. And connection and curiosity are two of the ways that we can soothe and regulate emotions. That really kind of caught my attention because I was thinking with my husband, like, how do I communicate with him using this method? <laughs> and I will try and I'll let you know if, if I'm <laughs> well, successful at it. But It's funny you say that because my <laughs> co-author, Ping Ho, who's the founder and director of UCLA Arts and Healing, she actually has a story where one day she and her husband were having a conflict and it wasn't resolved. It kind of went into the next day. And she said, she's like, he used our strategies against me, Erica. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. She said, he drew emojis with little word bubbles and slipped them under my door. And she said, I felt so touched. And she said she also felt so um, sort of seen and that the emotion he communicated through his little emoji drawing um, gave her new information in a way that she wasn't able to receive when they were talking and that she was able to physically see what he was experiencing and take that in. Um, so I also like to say when you use a strategy like what we're talking about here uh, is it's almost like a mediator. The paper, the drawing becomes a mediator between you and the other person. And so even that decreases the stress and tension and having a person to person interaction when we're both kind of in our defenses and feeling really vulnerable underneath, but needing to be in a state of defensiveness um, because it's too hard to drop into that vulnerability when we're talking to the person. But when we can put it on paper, it's easier to be a little bit more vulnerable with ourselves and with the other person as well. So true. Thank you again, Erica. I'll be say thank you throughout the interview because it resonates true to me that this is the way to navigate relationships <laughs> in general. This is such a wonderful Technique, I mean, advice, suggestions that you give. Talk to me about, in the book you address that too, some people who don't believe that they can become creative, they can be creative at this level. So yeah, is art therapy for everyone? Well, I think there's a couple questions in there, and so I'll pick them apart a little bit. I think in terms of people who don't feel creative or feel like they can be creative, and I try to uh, really speak to this in the book because so many people, oh, no, I can't do that. Oh, I can't draw. I'm not really inclined. Um, and that it really is just a different way of communicating what we're talking about here. Um, and a very, I believe, wise way of communicating because it works with the way that the brain uh, receives sensory in information versus verbal information when we're under stress. And that the brain is much more open to sensory information when we're under a lot of stress than it is open to verbal information. Um, and so helping people understand that and that really what creativity is, in my mind, I think of it very broadly, um, is it's almost like a repurposing. It's taking knowledge, ideas, maybe material objects, you know, even if that's a pencil and a paper or something else and creating something new creating something unique or novel um, out of those ideas and materials. Um, and so with the book, for example, it's, um, you know, we give a lot of very practical tips um, that people can use. You don't need to be an artist. Um, and that's where there's a line between art and creativity, where people say, well, I don't do art, but that's okay. Um, you can still access the material and try something new as a parent or as an educator. I'll say a lot of educators have also really benefited from this material, um, implementing it in their classrooms. Um, is art therapy for everyone? You know, I think that therapy is so personal. It is um, open and available to everybody, um, but different people also benefit from different approaches. And so I think that, you know, I have some adult clients, for example, who, um, you know, if I invite them to, for example, give a feeling, a color, shape, texture, or form, even just in their imagination, they look at me like I have three heads. Like, what? It's a, what do you mean it has a color or a shape? And that's okay. So I work with the way their mind works. And I say, well, can you see the word? Let's say it's anger. Can you see the word anger right now? Yes, I can picture that word. Can you give it a font, right? Oh, yeah, I can give it a font, 
right? Okay, well, now we've just gotten creative, right? Because now I've just imagined the word anger. I've given it a font. I can change that font color in my imagination. Now we have a creative approach or sort of felt sense of this word anger that's very unique to their own experience because this person and the next person will pick a different font and see it differently. And now all of a sudden they've accessed their creativity. It might be that the first step really, or the first thing to do is to become curious in general, to open up that space, to learn new ways of doing what we already do, but in a, in a more effective way. That's what it is too, right, Erica? I think so. Yes, I agree with that. And I think that creativity, curiosity helps us get into creativity. And I think creativity can also get us, um, help us into curiosity because when we can externalize a feeling, for example, or help our children to, even if it's a scribble, you know, show me how big your sad is right now. Can you scribble that on a piece of paper? Well, now it's an object. Now it's, a, it's an image. And so now we can get curious about it. So now let's take a look at this together. Huh, look at this. You know, would you like to add anything to it? Can we turn it upside down? Where does it live? Uh, Right. And so now we can get curious about sadness or whatever the feeling is because we have done something creative with it and created an object. So I think they I think they sort of creativity and, and curiosity, they have a nice little partnership and sometimes one leads and sometimes the other leads. It seems like it's more challenging with adults, isn't it? Than than children. It might be it might be easier with children. <laughs> with you actually <laughs> even early in my practice and in, in working as a psychotherapist I did a lot of work with children and adolescents and parents um, and then later on I started working more with just adults and doing couples therapy also and I like to have a lot of variety but you know people used to say like wow Erica you work with kids that's so hard and then I started working with adults because I was like really I don't think it's that hard and I started working with adults and I thought Oh my gosh, this is hard. <laughs> it's so much harder, right? <laughs> and I think it's because they're maybe, well, they're they're further away from the playfulness and the fun and the they're and they've had so many more, you know, hurts in their lives also that have compounded and created more protective features inside of themselves that make it difficult to access. Um, because I think even fun can be vulnerable. Mm. Oh, Eric, you're right. Yeah. Yeah, it's very compassionate, <laughs> the work you do. Even fun, that really resonates. Yeah, even fun, uh, it's a vulnerable thing sometimes to open up and be fun and laugh freely. Yeah, that requires some open up to do, right? To be open in a space with the person. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, too, adults who work with children or have their own children, they're also afraid of losing control. And I think that there is a sense that if we get too playful or we have too much fun, um, then either it's I'm going to lose control of the situation or the seriousness of a situation will be lost. And I think it's important for people to experience that the two don't have to be mutually exclusive, um, that we can, and we talk about this in the book, um, this balance between expression and containment. And that is also going back to your question, actually, about what are one of our purposes in life as human beings is to really experiment with and try to refine that balance. How do we express ourselves in a way that doesn't overwhelm us? in a way that doesn't overwhelm other people? Um, how do I meet my own needs and the needs of others, especially when they're in conflict? Um, and this is all about expression and containment. And this is something, I mean, we can see this on a daily basis with children that they are just struggling with knowing how how to strike this balance. Um, and, and I think that that's something that that adults get afraid of. If I if I loosen up on the limits and allow more expression, um, then things are going to go crazy. 
it must be a challenge, right, Eric? I'm thinking about so many mothers that I talk to, parents, and I see that. What a dance <laughs> there must be being a parent. <laughs> well, and what a, it, it is. I, I would say that parenting is the biggest challenge of my life. And I would say has grown me up as a human being more than anything. And I think that that is true of all things in life, that where we bump up against challenge and discomfort um, and allow it and, and approach it with curiosity and creativity, that that's where we grow as individuals as well. So my my children are, are my biggest gift in my life, um, not just in terms of fulfilling my life, but also in terms of um, me really um, doing my work so that I can be the most, you know, open, conscious human being I can be for my own children. Something that you wrote in your book that has to do with having fun, um, you say in actually health, well-being, you say simple creative activities that result in laughter can not only bring more joy to family life, they may even boost immunity. So talk to me for a moment about that, that connection. Yes. And so there's been a number of studies um, where they find um, positive medical health outcomes uh, when people laugh, just simply laugh, Um, that they see, um, you know, decreased markers of stress hormones when people laugh. Um, They might, um, you know, we might even look at things like decreased need for pain medication for people who might be on pain medication. Um, And so there's been a number of brilliant studies that look at the role uh, laughter plays in boosting our immunity response and our system and also decreasing our stress response. Yeah, at the um, energetic level, we we're speaking using that language, it also resonates with me. Everything just, um, it becomes more free in a way, isn't it? A freeing thing. I feel that laughter, it's just so powerful. Well, there's a way also to re- speaking about energy to release energy. You know, we experience all these physiological responses to our day to day experience. Um, you know, and uh, people experience a lot of stress in their lives. Um, and then we sit at a desk in a chair, <laughs> and we don't move. We don't move it out. And so, anything that we can also, like you said, sort of energetically move that energy through us and out of us, our body wants to release. Um, And we don't often give it the opportunity to do that. We talk also in the book, not just about visual arts, but also using movement and rhythm. And I think I share an anecdote about, you know, when my kids were in conflict at the dinner table and I just turned on music and just said, dance party. (laughs) And we just got up and, and well, at first they were looking at me like I was crazy, (laughs) but I just got up and started dancing because I was feeling stressed. (laughs) So I just put on music and I started dancing and then one of my kids started dancing with me and then the other two forced didn't want to feel left out. So then they got up and started dancing. And then once we were able to move that energy, that angsty, conflictual energy out of us, then we can say, oh, okay, what just happened? What's going on? Uh, and then we could talk about what had just transpired and resolve it. We're almost at the end. I have too many here notes on the book, but there's something else that caught my attention about the uh, parenting short and long term goals. Talk to me for a moment about that, Erica. Yes, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, You know, talking about resisting the moment and wanting to control, control the behavior. We were talking about that a little bit ago. And I think that one of the reasons, in addition to being afraid of losing control, we also get bogged down as as teachers, as educators. I mean, anybody, parents, grandparents, anybody who has a child in their life, that we get stuck on these immediate goals of get your shoes on, get out the door, get the kid fed, get them to school, get the homework done. All these very transactional, daily living functional kind of Um, but we need to get in the car um, kind of goals. And we parent often from that place of short-term, immediate, my goal is to get my kids' shoes on. And we forget that 
really what we want to be doing is parenting from a place of long-term goals. What kind of human being do I want to raise? Um, And so if we think in terms of, well, I want a child to grow up to be self-sufficient, loving, compassionate, um, hardworking. Um, I mean, I can go on and on. There's hundreds of things that we can probably thousands, really. But if we get clarity on those goals and suddenly, you know, put your shoes on, put your shoes on, put your shoes on isn't the task, the grand task in the moment of putting your shoes on actually becomes, for example, self-sufficiency. And so um, maybe it's okay if we're a little bit late because look at them struggling with putting their own shoe on right now. And they're learning to work through a problem. They're learning to work through and to struggle through something and then be able to feel the success of saying, I struggled through that and I did it. Look, I put my shoe on, right? And so these little simple tasks um, can hold so much meaning in terms of developing a child's sense of self, identity, and and the way that they're going to move through the world. So in a way that takes, you said the word earlier, conscious, being conscious as a parent, so we, we can uh, lead others unless we know how to lead ourselves. So that makes sense, come from a, that place of, of being the lesson that you want to teach in a way, right, um, Erica? So, right. so they can see that in you by you being a conscious parent. Yeah, then or balanced. I mean, balance is something that uh, I know it's always um, in and out is never one destination, but the sense of, like you said, seeing the goal, having that vision, the, the bigger picture of life. Right. And that, like you said, it can be a balance. It doesn't have to be one or the other, that we're not going to spend a half hour trying to put the shoes on if we really need to get out the door. (laughs) Right. But that's just an example But we can find we can strike a balance. Um, You know, a, a memory comes to mind of one of my sons when he was very little and he was pouring his orange juice into his oatmeal. And my husband said, oh, no, 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 don't do that. You know, don't play with your food. And I was like, well, hold on a minute. <laughs> you know? And I said, I said, what do you, tell me what you're doing. And he said, my son said, I'm making a new recipe. And I said, okay. I said, well, let's do this. Let's create containment for this experiment of create a new recipe. Here's another bowl. Take one scoop of oatmeal, pour a little orange juice, and then try it because we don't want to pour all the orange juice in and then say, oh, I don't like it. And now we're throwing out the, you know, the breakfast. So we can provide containment um, for that experimentation um, so that we strike again. That's what we're wanting to teach our children, how to strike a balance. Right. Yeah. And you do. It's interesting that you said that earlier now, too. It's so true. And you, in your book, that's one of the passages that caught my attention where you say exactly that kids need a balance between freedom of expression and containment. That's very clear. Um, and you say something, another, another thing about, um, let's see, boundaries. Saying no also provides the opportunity to teach valuable lessons such as consideration of others and time constraints. So boundaries are very, very important. That's true. Yes. And that's, I mean, we need that um, for ourselves too, right, Erica? That's something that we need as adults to work on. Right. And that when we do say no to a child, also in terms of, the, you know, there's the short term goal of maybe stopping a behavior or saying, right. But then there's a the long term goal of teaching children that that's OK. It's OK to tell people no. And and the relationship doesn't crumble. We're we're still OK. Um, I can say that doesn't work for me right now. Um, please don't do that. Uh, and they can regulate around that and, and we can move on because we want to raise, I believe, I mean, at least I want to raise adults who can also set boundaries with themselves and with right. other people. It's very, very important. I agree. So we're almost at the end. And my final points about your book, something else that caught my attention, Letting Go, Chapter 2, you say, change your thoughts and change your experience. Uh, That just kind of immediately (laughs) caught me. So, so true. Do you want to make a comment about that, Erica? 
Yes, I think that, again, at least in that context, it goes back to feeling like I can't do something or I need to have more control over this or sort of our own stress when something isn't going the way we want it to go. I think a very typical example of that is, you know, like a family vacation or something where like we have these visions of it going beautifully. And then of course, like the kids are grumpy and they're outside their comfort zone and they haven't eaten and they're having tantrums. And then, and then we get in this place of like, it shouldn't be like this. (laughs) Right. And then we take it personally and we feel like they're not being grateful because we spend so much time and money planning this beautiful trip. And I think I say in the book somewhere, you know, art is messy, uh, but so is life. So is life. And so if we can practice with our children and with ourselves getting a little messy with paint, with drawing, with a dance party, with whatever it is, if we can get a little messy there in the day, um, we're really practicing being able to let go in life um, and dealing with the messes of life also. Uh, I love that too. <laughs> How many loves can I say to that? Yes, a billion times to that. Uh, life is messy. Art is messy, as you said, and so is life. Yeah. Right. And I think around the idea that's where people, in terms of letting go with, ooh, like, I don't know about using some of these creative strategies at home because it might make a mess. It's going to take up too much time. It's et cetera, et cetera. Um, that that's where we can notice where we're resisting and say, you know what, maybe it's okay. Maybe, maybe it's okay. And what if I just let go right now and let them make a mess? Um, And then we can clean it up. And those are the limits. Um, So I think, you know, I think it's helpful to think in terms of, I often will evaluate a situation with my children in terms of, is it safe? Right. If it's not safe, then I'm going to stop it. I'm going to set a limit. Right. Is it safe? Is it respectful of people and property? Um, And does it align with our family values? And if I stand back and, you know, look at my daughter hanging off of a tree branch and I think, okay, well, does it align with our family values? Yeah, sure. You know, um, we appreciate nature and, and stretching ourselves and challenging our bodies and climbing and, you know, and like, okay, well, is it respectful of people and property? Yeah, it looks like a strong branch. I don't think she's going to break the tree. You know, that's fine. Okay. Um, is it safe? Hmm. Okay. Let me see. What's the worst that could happen if she fell right now? And then I stretch myself and I go, you know, worst thing, maybe she would fracture a bone. Probably not. I think it's okay. Right? <laughs> Thank you so much for being you, the work you do. It's truly wonderful and has so many suggestions there. I have to go back and apply that in my own home with my husband. <laughs> yeah, let me know how that goes. <laughs> yes, yes, I will. It's funny because you just kind of really inspired me to do that. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It'll be the next book. I'll write one for adults for dealing with adults. <laughs> yes, we need that. Yes. <laughs> That's so challenging at communicating when we are stressed and, you know, in the midst of emotional turmoil. It's like I have no idea how to communicate using words. But yeah, art is the way. Well, and it's for good reason. I, there's there's interesting brain scans that they've done that actually shows that the blood flows away from the thinking, problem-solving part of the brain when we're stressed and in conflict. So it makes sense that it's difficult to problem-solve and access our words when we're under stress. I, and I think it's a very common experience that adults have that I, I can't quite access or communicate what it is that I'm feeling or needing right now. So yeah, it'll be the next book and I'll... I'll I'll put you in there as my inspiration for that. (laughs) Yeah, please let me know if you really do it, because that would be something that's, uh, for me, it would be very useful. Because it is a challenge, and for, you said, from scientific reasons, yeah, biological, of course, reasons. We know that that happens, but we don't know what to do, and that will be a very, a very good tool to have. <laughs> so um, we are almost at the end. I do have a few more questions for you, Erica. Uh, the ending questions. Would you like to add anything or read a passage in your book before that? Um, don't have anything to add. I would. I don't know if you have a passage that... Um, otherwise I'll have to run over and grab it off of my bookshelf. <laughs> right. 
Yeah, I have small passages, some of I them that I would love for you to read that if you have that available. Something that caught my attention was actually suggestions or messages, powerful messages. Another one was uh, when children feel connected, homes tend to be more harmonious and children feel valued. It's a very short passage, but it's so powerful and it says it all. It's connectivity within and with the outside world, with others. And that's when everything changes. So that resonated. But if you want to read another passage in your book, I'll wait for you here. <laughs> well, thank, let me go and grab a, the book then. Yes, read, please. I think I'll actually read from the very beginning, the opening passage here. The task of parenting is like passing a baton from, from one generation to the next. We all inherited a baton from our parents, which they inherited from theirs, and so on. Our parents did the best they could with whatever baton they were dealt. Perhaps they added decorative ribbons or made some cracks of their own in it. We were handed that baton, varnish, barbed wire, splinters, colorful paint, and all. We start with this. When we parent, we pass the baton to our children. What we hand to them in part is what we have inherited, but we can improve upon what we pass on to them. We can remove tattered ribbons, sand down splinters, polish it, attach embellishments of our own. It won't be perfect, but it can be better than before. And our children will have the same chance to make it better yet for their children. I love that. Yeah, this becoming conscious enough to to change the legacy, right, that we leave here. And that is beautiful. Thank you so much, Erica, for the work you do. Thank you for the opportunity. So my last question is, what is another word for life? Well, creativity just sprung to my mind. So I'll say creativity. That was the first, just go with what comes to mind, right? Rather than editing it or thinking over it. But that must have just come from a very organic place. So I'll say creativity. Yes. And I'll ask you another question. (laughs) What are three things about life you wish everyone to experience before they lose the body? We've been talking a lot about connection. Um, I think connection with others, really safe, nurturing, caring connection, what that feels like um, to be lovable and to not have to work at being loved or to feel like you have to work at being loved. Um, But to know that that can, although, you know, love can be difficult at times, but to have that real felt sense of, um, I don't have to work at this. I am lovable. Um, and I think that that ties in also to, of course, having the experience of loving oneself, um, and knowing what that experience is like. Um, and thirdly, I mean, I think those two really encapsulate it all, you know, perhaps the experience of challenging yourself. We talked about that today, to be able to overcome a challenge or or even just move through a challenge. It doesn't have to feel like you're overcoming something, but to um, challenge oneself and to really know the feeling of growing as a human being uh, because of a challenge. And I think that those are the three most powerful, essential components of of wellness. Uh, What can I say, Erica? Thank you so much for your presence and your contribution to a more loving, peaceful reality. Well, and same to you, Valeria. Thank you for the work you do and congratulations on all of the people that you've brought forth and into having that access, right? Just sort of into the world in the sense of making information and knowledge and, and these thoughts available to a wider audience um it just grows then right it just grows and multiplies and and then we just all sort of you know especially during these recent times um these difficult you know times that people have gone through i've told my clients i've reminded myself look for the helpers and healers in the world when you're feeling really down 
um, really hopeless, just look around because the helpers and healers are everywhere. Uh, and that, I think, reignites a sense of hope um, and well-being within each of us individually. So thank you for, for bringing all of this information, not just mine, but all of your speakers um, out there into the world because um, people really benefit. Uh, it has been an amazing experience, really, to talk to so many amazing human beings. It has changed me in so many ways. So before we say goodbye, where can we find more information about you, your books, products, services, and future projects? Thank you. So my website is therapywitherica.com and my name is spelled E-R-I-C-A. Um, our book is available anywhere you can buy a book, Amazon or Barnes Nobles or your local bookstore. And again, that's The Innovative Parent, Raising Connected, Happy, Successful Kids Through Art. And I'll just mention again, my co-author is Ping Ho and she is the founder director of UCLA Arts and Healing. Um, and you can look up their organization online as well. And they offer a lot of free workshops. And we've done since COVID um, first started, uh, we developed uh, an online series of workshops to make a lot of information available to people that are based in different creative forms for health and well-being. And those are free to the public. So if anybody's interested in taking a look at their workshop series, it's called the Hope Series. Um, and they can go to UCLA Arts and Healing. I believe it's .org, but they can check um, and find information about that as well. Thank you so much again, Erica, and we'll talk soon. Bye for now. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Erica Curtis and her work, please visit therapywitherica.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.